Todd, no my Haramai, welcome here to Tamaki Makoto Auckland uh, for this briefing today, and particularly uh, welcome here to uh, the Tamaki Vaccination Centre, uh, which is really appropriate given the outsized contribution that our Māori and other community providers have made to our COVID efforts over the last uh, significant period of time. Uh, my name is Andrew Oll, I lead the Public Health Agency, and I'm joined today by Dr. Pete Watson, the Interim National Medical Director at Te Whātua Water of New Zealand, and Leanne Manuel, Chief Executive at Te Whai Ora, the Māori Health Project. Hello, Māori, and welcome to both of you, and thank you for your time today. So today I'm going to begin with an assessment of the COVID-19 outbreak before handing it over to Pete. Uh, who's going to talk a little bit about how the health system is tracking this winter. Aliana will talk to us about how Māori providers are continuing to respond to COVID-19. And we'll have some final remarks before opening up uh, for questions. But first, today's numbers. Today we are reporting 4,489 new community cases of COVID-19 and 496 hospitalisations, which includes 13 people in intensive care, and 16 new COVID related deaths. These deaths are still being assessed, but based on the analysis of previous COVID deaths, we would expect somewhere between half and three quarters to eventually be attributed to COVID 19. Taking a step back from today's numbers, a COVID 19 surveillance is telling us that broadly, community transmission of COVID 19 is continuing to trend downwards, and this is now also being reflected in our hospitalisation numbers. The seven day rolling average of tax rates continues to trend downwards across all regions for the fourth week in a row. A further 20% in the week ended 14 August. Pleasingly, the case rate among over 65s, which is one of the groups most vulnerable to severe disease from COVID 19, has also dropped for the fourth week running, decreasing by 24% in that same week to the, 20, to the 14th of August. Finally, case rates among healthcare workers have declined for the fifth week running, and the level of virus circulating in wastewater across the Motu is continuing to decline also. Moving now to hospitalisations, in the week ending 14th of August, we've seen a further decrease in the seven day rolling average of hospitalisations due to COVID 19, down 11.1% on the week before. Hospitalisation rates have dropped in three of the four regions in the country rising only slightly in the central region, region, which represents a plateau for them. This is the second week with a drop in hospitalisation rates after five straight weeks of increases. As we've said before, hospitalisations do tend to lag behind trends in case numbers by a week or two, and that is consistent with what we're seeing this time. It remains an incredibly busy time for our hospitals, however, and Pete will talk more broadly on this shortly but it does suggest there's been a sustained reduction in people with COVID-19 um, requiring hospital level care, which is fantastic. Uh, trends in deaths also usually lag reported cases, and as you know, it can take time to assess whether a death was caused by someone having COVID-19 at the time or some other reason. We now have 1,782 deaths that we are attributing to COVID, um, but bearing both these points in mind, it is important that um, we're not, uh, not quite ready to assume that we have, that deaths from COVID-19 have truly peaked, although we are very hopeful given the trends that we're seeing in cases and hospitalisations. It's important to stress that thanks to our low levels of community trans transmission early in the pandemic and our high vaccination rates, New Zealand continues to have a lower rate of deaths from COVID-19 since the start of the pandemic compared to many countries. For example, based on a recent analysis in the UK, their COVID death rate was 2,748 deaths per million population, and in the US, 3,077 deaths per million. If we had the same rate as the UK, we would be reporting over 13,000 deaths, and over 15,000 deaths if we were looking like the US. This is no consolation, of course, to all the people who have lost loved ones to COVID-19, and our thoughts, as always, are with them uh, at this time. Uh, but it does help put into perspective the significant effort and relative success of the New Zealand approach to COVID-19 over the last two and a half years. Looking ahead, the modelling from COVID modelling Aotearoa shows that we are continuing to track at the lower end of what was expected in terms of a second wave this winter. 
We passed the peak in cases earlier than the modelling suggested, and now hospitalisations are also declining, suggesting these two have peaked. At sitting between somewhere between 800 and 850 occupied beds across the country in late July. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand over to Pete. Pete. Uh, thank you, Dr. Old, uh, and it's great to have Rihanna here with us as well. Tēnā uh, koutou katoa. So yes, the recent drop in COVID-19 cases is an encouraging trend. By each one of us sticking to public health measures, we are making a difference. That is despite the fact that over this winter, we and our health system have faced a really huge set of challenges. Never before has Aotearoa been tasked with managing such a high prevalence of COVID-19 cases alongside a really big season of influenza, as well as increases in other winter illnesses. Not only has the high demand on our health services, uh, not only has this demand on our health services been at record highs, but this has had major impacts on our workforce. So despite the pressure, winter 2022 has made me incredibly proud to be part of this system of health workers striving every day to make a difference to our patients, whānau and communities. I've seen us supporting our partners in aged residential care. I've seen GPs and practice nurses being incredibly busy out on the front line in their communities, uh, providing a huge range of services to support patients in their homes, and also ambulance services doing their typically terrific job. I've also seen hospitals, and that includes all of our clinical and non-clinical teams, taking all actions available to ensure patients get the care they need in a timely manner, ensuring as little disruption to plan care services as we can manage. I can honestly say this has been a truly epic task. As a country, we are very, very grateful and fortunate to have such a committed, high-quality workforce. Inside a hospital capacity, the health sector has planned for a challenging winter. We've got it, and as a result of the planning, my colleagues around the motu have been able to work together consistently to keep delivering. At the same time, districts have been experiencing their own winter demands, the need for staff to isolate or care for isolating whānau or other care in their families. But with cases of COVID, influenza and other winter respiratory illnesses now signalling encouraging signs of a downward trend, we are hoping some of the pressure on our health system will start to ease. In the meantime, I can report that our work across Te Whatawara regions continues to work to keep New Zealand as well. In the northern region, non-deferrable care, such as cancer treatments, birthing, labour, uh, is continuing to be delivered as clinical urgency is prioritised, as well as this less urgent plan care is now increasing as capacity allows. Services across Te Manawataki region have continued to manage high demand while experiencing higher than normal staff illness. Resourcing has been assessed daily and this informs scheduling for planned care. In the central region, acute or emergency care, as well as non-deferrable care such as cardiac, thoracic, cancer and paediatric care is con largely continuing as normal. This is a fantastic testament to the treatment uh, and uh, being able to be delivered by these services. Across to Waiponamu, and plain care cases are continuing where resources are available. Day cases are also continuing as capacity allows, and districts are continuing to work together to utilise available resources. So, for instance, South Canterbury is supporting southern uh, region, uh, sorry, the southern district joint replacements, and Canterbury um, as well in their ENT and gastroenterology lists. So while we do expect a continued long tail of COVID-19 cases and workforce illness, the recent decline of cases is now flowing through to a reduction in severely ill people with COVID-19 who might have been requiring hospital level care, and this eases pressure on our system. What about RSV? So respiratory syncytial virus in the northern region um, has been a particularly common cause of hospitalisation for lower hospital, uh, uh, hos uh, respiratory tract infection for under two-year-olds. Uh, last year, at this time in the northern region, 
um, we had 3,800 cases. At this time, um, we are only uh, had 248 positive cases. In fact, during the peak of last year's RSV outbreak, the end of July, start of August, the northern region was dealing with more than 600 cases of RSV a week. Weekly cases this year have so far remained under 100, averaging around 60 cases a week. Of those positive cases that have required hospitalisation, the average stay in hospital has been two days. We are also not seeing the same week-on-week -week increase in cases as we saw in last year's peak. So again, these are encouraging signs. We're continuing to monitor these RSV numbers alongside other conditions and encouraging people to keep up with their current health measures. I'd like to turn to vaccination. Vaccination, of course, remains the cornerstone in our response to COVID-19, but also to influenza and many other conditions, particularly childhood conditions, and it's a very important and critical prevention of measles. We've said it before, vaccination saves lives, but it also reduces the severity of illness and the likelihood of hospitalisation. Uh, this winter, the government has a widened access to free flu vaccines for people, including children, who are more risk of hospitalisation, and made second COVID-19 booster available six months after the first booster for older New Zealanders and other groups. That's made it easier than ever to get vaccination. So I'd ask everybody, if you're due a flu or COVID-19 vaccination or a measles vaccination, please don't delay, go and get it today. In closing, I want to reiterate the simple things which count. Vaccination, mask wearing, isolating when unwell, testing, and self-reporting results. It's these basic health measures which have served us well to date. If we do these basic things well, we'll help protect not only ourselves, but our most vulnerable people, our tamariki, our older people, Māori and Pacific communities, disabled people, pregnant people and people who are immunocompromised. We all know and care about someone in these groups and our actions to date have helped protect them. Let's keep caring about them. Uh, kia kaha, kia ora, koutou katoa. Uh, thank you and I'll now hand over to Rihanna. Kia ora, Rihanna. A tēnā rā koutou katoa e hui hui mai nei i raro i te maru o tēnei whare a tāhua, nei ngā mihi ki Ngāti Whātua, ki o Arākei, ingari mō tō koutou a Tautoko, Tiaki, Manaki i a tātou katoa i tēnei rangi. Uh, good afternoon, I think we're in now. Um, I've just got a, a few things to add and just really want to acknowledge first and foremost the hard work that's been done on the front line all throughout the motu by our, not only our kaupapa Māori providers or our iwi providers, but by all of our providers, as mentioned by my colleagues. I also want to um, reiterate and acknowledge the importance of vaccination and what the role that it plays here for our people. It remains the best protection against preventable diseases in general. I now want to talk to um, and, and remind ourselves that COVID is not a seasonal, uh, it's not a seasonal um, disease it, or virus. And while COVID numbers may be decreasing, our Māori providers are still too aware of the work that lies in front of them. And whilst those providers um, are out there working every day, I want to acknowledge that they are a defence force who provide unwavering commitment to our Māori communities when called upon and not just the Māori communities, but all communities around the motu. Across the country, they are working at pace to keep, uh, keep providing uh, the services that are not just services around Hauora, but also acknowledging the Kai Hub, the health in the community, uh, care in the community, and those who are isolating. Our outreach, outreach programs, such as Te Whātoro Hauora uh, Outreach, which is a collective and collaborative of Te Tai Tokero providers, they mobilise through six camper van units. They get out to hard to reach areas of the north. They set up this in June uh, this year and of course include the six providers such as Ngāti Hine, Te Whare Awhina o Ngāti Tautai, Te Hau Awhiowhio o, o Tāngarei Trust, Te Iwi o Ngāti Kahu, Te Manga Pūriri and Te Raro Trust purchased the camper vans and have provided the services. 
It was an opportunity to be mobile, to reach more remote communities, because whilst we have our clinics and our hubs and our more urban centres, we have to remind ourselves of the need of our rural communities. And also want to acknowledge urban initiatives such as Tamaki Health Hub. This is a Ngāti Whātua Orake initiative who not only vaccinate here every day, and we've just seen it for ourselves as we walked in, but they also offer a social supermarket, full health checks, vaccinations and of course childhood immunisations. I just want to point out that, this, that initiatives that have popped up during COVID, such as uh, the social supermarket, have been one of the most amazing disrupt disruptive innovations. And I just also want to acknowledge that prior to COVID, Kaupapa Māori providers would often reach out and provide these services. So to have them recognised and ongoing funding available means that communities and our whānau, wherever they may be, are able to access basics such as kai, housing support, and of course, this all goes to um, improving wellbeing for our people. So on that note, uh, one final shout out to all of those providers. Kia kaha, kia maia, kia manawa nui. Uh, just to say that um, we acknowledge that you're all out there on the front line. We're going to be doing everything we can uh, during, during this process of te whatuora, te akawhaiora and te manatū hauora providing better care and services for our people. Mauri ore te whare. Kia ora, Rihanna, and... Pete, thank you. Uh, so in summary, uh, there is some good news on the COVID-19 front. We have decreasing cases, decreasing hospitalisations, and we're hopeful that we've turned the corner in terms of deaths as well. I do want to emphasise, however, that COVID-19 is continuing to have a significant impact, particularly among our most vulnerable. While cases and hospitalisations have declined, we are continuing to see deaths on a daily basis and we can't take our eyes away from that. I would emphasise also that despite the recent decline in cases, and that is clearly good news, this pandemic still has some way to run. There remains the potential for a resurgence in COVID-19 cases and as Rihanna's just said, uh, we have seen overseas significant waves of COVID through the Northern Hemisphere summer, so it's not, uh, it's not going to behave as a seasonal disease. That means it's important that we all continue to take steps to protect ourselves, our whānau and our communities. Please get vaccinated and boosted if you're eligible. Continue to wear masks in indoor areas outside your home. Get tested and stay home when you're unwell. All these things, as Pete has said, uh, help reduce the opportunity for COVID-19 to spread. The final thing I'll say before opening up for questions is really just to reiterate the call that's already been made to think about other things other than COVID-19 as well, uh, particularly um, focus on childhood immunisations. Uh, we know that we are at risk uh, of uh, outbreaks of other diseases. Um, Pete's mentioned measles as one, and so I just really want people to uh, use this week to check that they themselves are up to date with their vaccinations, and if you have children, that your children are up to date with their vaccinations. It really could make the difference uh, in the weeks and months ahead. And with that, um, we will open up for uh, questions, and all three of us are able to take questions. Um, as you said there, Andrew, we've seen cases dropping out for a number of weeks. So it's really safe to say that we're well over that second wave now? I think that's a fair, a fair assessment. We, we're always a little bit cautious about calling those things too early, uh, but certainly in terms of that second wave, yes, uh, we, we seem to have passed that peak and be coming down into the, into the, the next um, our next plateau. The question that we have now is how low will we go in terms of daily cases? Uh, we didn't drop quite as low as we expected between our earlier peak and the second peak, uh, and that's going to be particularly important uh, in terms of the, uh, the ongoing impact of COVID-19 over the next, the next few months. As you said, we can't become complacent. COVID is now here with us, and it has been for some time now. Is there any modelling being done about when we might see that upsurge of, of cases again? I know that we've just got off, starting to get down off that second wave, but any modelling going forward? 
Uh, so there is certainly modelling underway to look at that. We don't have that available here yet, but I think the, the modelling that's been done recently in Australia, um, out of uh, Victoria, is probably instructive for what we might expect. We now have uh, reasonable information from around the world about how COVID behaves. Uh, lots of caveats around the fact that we're always modelling based on what we know uh, and you know, new variants are always of concern how they might behave. Uh, but we would expect now that we will see continued waves of COVID-19 uh, for some time to come. Uh, the questions which of course the modellers desperately try and answer and are really important for uh, health services like um, the ones that, uh, that Pete represents is how uh, is when and, and how, how high. So those are questions that we're trying to answer. It's a question about family care. It's probably more for Pete. Um, are you open to the mic? Um, just, you know, talking about the, those, um, what you were quoting me before about what's happening with family care around the country, it's quite general. You know, saying that um, it's, for example, in Tawai Ponanu, it's happening as and when it can. Can you give us any more detail about the kind of planned care that's still being delayed and how often that's happening? I don't have the specifics district by district, but everywhere is managing to do more than we were when we were in the search. So that's the good news. And as the capacity comes available, we're doing more. So everyone has got that very much in the Tatafatawara districts as something that we need to get on with. I know that the work of the Plan Care Task Force will also be released in the not too distant future, which is going to provide some further guidance and advice about how we go about tackling this, because it's become a big issue um, that we all recognise. Uh, but everywhere is doing the you know, clinically urgent and indicated work, um, and to a varying degree, uh, other less urgent work. But it's done list by list, service by service, district by district, um, but as I referenced, then we've seen now within Te Whatua and the new system uh, a much greater degree, I believe, of collaboration and cooperation. So the example of South Canterbury being able to pick up their neighbours' works in some areas is just one example of that, but that was happening across the different districts. So are there any cases on any days where some of that urgent um, can can't happen, like the delays to the heart? Um, yeah, not that I'm aware of. As I understand it now, all of the you know, as all of the cancer and P1 work has been done in some areas. Some of the P2 work, which is the work which is not quite as urgent, needs to be deferred. But less and less of that has been deferred. And in some places now, we're even moving into the P3, that work that can wait the longest. And what are your colleagues around the country telling you? Not just about family care, but about the pressure on your hospitals. What are they telling you about? how busy things are mm. for them at the moment. So the, the health system has already has been under pressure and continues to be under pressure. So while the COVID cases are decreasing, um, we've experienced the big surge in influenza. We're over that as well. Um, but there's everything else that's still presenting. And this is across primary care, age residential care, as well as our emergency departments and hospitals. So it is pressured, and part of that is contributed to by, as I referenced, the pressure on workforce. That the workforce you know, is susceptible to the same winter illnesses as in COVID as the rest of us. So um, there's been high levels of staff sickness and absence because of COVID. Uh, so that has been a, that's been part of the real pressure on the system. So it remains really a big focus to supporting workforce um, to be able to deliver the service. Um, today marks a year since Delta arrived in the country and, and we went into lockdown. I was perhaps just after a reflection from you on the past year, you know, yesterday was the, the last day that we had a zero cases of COVID in New Zealand day. Just, just after a reflection of what you on the past year and then how everything's changed, I guess. Sure, and I might ask um, the others to comment as well, but it's been, um, you know, <laughs> a year that as I, I think I um, highlighted uh, just present just enormous challenges for us, I think, as a country, as communities, and the health system, health system in particular has been, you know, really um, tasked with something that we'd never seen before in terms of the volume and how we were going to uh, face that. 
I'm incredibly proud of the response. Um, it's been really hard. We've got through it, and I think we've done a, actually a, a pretty stunning job when you look around and you see how we have managed compared to some other countries uh, by comparison. We've saved a lot of lives, and that's, I think, is a direct result of what we have done to address that, to prepare and be able to manage. But perhaps I'll hand over to others to comment. I would say that almost a, a, a year to the day we found the first cases down in Coromandel, uh, for instance, and I was on the front line during that time. So when I stand here and reflect on the year that was, it's been um, uh, an incredible year where I've seen people collaborate, operate. Uh, we've had teams out on the road for seven days of a week during those peak times. We've had people running kaita communities. We've had a country that collaborated like I've never seen before and you know and of course on July the 1st we launch a kaupapa uh, that's really dear to my heart so I think we've we've you know through it all we've maintained this whakaaro kia whakakotai ai tātou. let's stay together thanks uh, thank you both and maybe just to to build on that a little bit to say um, at the point that we went into lockdown a year ago today, just 23% of New Zealanders had received two doses of vaccine. By the time the COVID protection framework was announced three months later, that figure was 82%. And so I really want to um, echo the comments that both Pete and Rihanna have made about the incredible effort um, that not only the health sector but the community at large put in to um, keeping us all safe through that time. It's been, uh, it's been an amazing year to be part of. It's been incredibly tiring at times, uh, but I think you know, the way that people have pulled together has been incredibly inspiring. The, the other um, number that I've got here which um, sort of floored me a little bit is uh, between the 17th of August last year and the 15th of August, so is that uh, two days ago, uh, we have administered nine million 39,444 uh, COVID-19 vaccinations to New Zealanders. So, I mean, that just I think puts in perspective the size just of that part of just of that part of the effort. You mentioned vaccination there in the UK. You might have seen the big group of this um, dual vaccination of uh, you know the Omicron variant and the original variant. Is there any indication of work underway to have that happening here? So we're, we're obviously watching really closely what's happening overseas with the development of new vaccines for COVID-19. Uh, the vaccine that we're using, as people know, was uh, developed really quickly early on, but it was designed against sort of the original strains. We're lucky that it still continues to provide really, really good protection against severe disease and death. Uh, but what it's not so effective at now is preventing transmission between people, uh, which is part of the reason why we've um, had the, the waves of Omicron that we've had despite our high levels of vaccination. So we're watching those developments really closely. Uh, the companies have not made applications here to my knowledge yet, uh, but we're certainly building in um, some of those things in terms of our future thinking because I would expect that they will become part of our toolkit in the future. Since we're coming down to the second peak now, would you like to see isolation rules changing? Look, that's a really timely question. So I think one of the things that uh, we've committed to all the way through is constantly reviewing the set of uh, protective measures that are in place to make sure that they continue to both be protective and be proportionate to the risk that's there. So we're in the middle right now of reviewing the range of measures that we uh, that we have available to us. Um, as I say, that process is underway now. We'll be providing that advice. Uh, through to the government for their decision-making process in the next uh, in the next week or so. And is it looking like those isolation rules might change? Do you have any uh, advice at this stage? No, I wouldn't want to preempt that process, but just to say that all of the things that are currently in the framework uh, and various protective measures are being looked at to make sure that they're still appropriate and proportionate. Uh, and when those uh, after that advice has been provided, the government will make its decision. I just had a question about monkey pops, if that's all right. I'm not sure if it would be the best place to answer that, but are we any closer to rolling out our public health response uh, to monkey pops, and are we any closer to knowing when we might get vaccines? 
Um, I can probably start to answer that. I don't know whether Pete wants to um, wants to add anything, but um, in terms of our public health response, the public health response is well underway. So there is a, a group um, that is working now, which includes uh, community representatives from the Burnett Foundation, with a real focus on the health promotion aspects of prevention. We're really fortunate at the moment that we've just had the four confirmed cases of monkeypox in the country, so we have time to prepare. And so the biggest uh, defence at the moment is making sure that people understand what monkeypox is, how it transmits and what risk behaviours look like in terms of being able to keep themselves and their, and their communities safe. So that work is very much going on. In terms of the vaccine, um, we are actively working um, through Pharmac with um, the vaccine manufacturer. Um, that contact was first made back in May at the time that the first cases were, um, were identified. There is a challenge with the global supply at the moment. Uh, there is only one manufacturer of the third generation vaccine that we are, we are seeking uh, and the global demand is high. And essentially uh, what the manufacturer is prioritising countries where they have significant outbreaks. So that does mean that we're likely to, um, to not be right at the front of the queue, but we are hopeful that we'll have more information about a confirmed timeline to share um, in the next week or so. About the um, man who is masquerading as a doctor at Middle Wharf Um Can you? Um, I'll just wait till you there. Um, where are where are Middle Wharf investigations at into that situation? Sure. So as you'll know, um, that person is no longer employed by Te Whatua County's Manukau, and the matter is now with the police. So, as I understand it, investigation is being um, undertaken there. I can um, uh, reassure people that uh, we've undertaken a review of every patient seen by that uh, person and there have been no concerns uh, found um, at this point. Uh, and we're also taking the opportunity, and I guess this talks to the move into Te Whatua as a national system to ensure that all our employment processes are where we need them to be. Oh, we made. I, I caught up with that this morning. We're making really good progress on. We haven't managed to contact all of them yet, but all of them we have. Um, there's been no issues identified. And we've heard about there are about eighty. Is that is that correct? Ah, uh, yep. Yeah, that's that's correct. Just time for a couple more questions, folks. I have a couple for Rihanna. Everyone's asking about the Rihanna uh, just um, another case that's been up uh, this week about a uh, Māori man in uh, Whanganui who mm. died after getting a complications from an ear infection and there was um, suggestion of bias in his treatment. In terms of what the Māori Health Authority can do, um, we had the Daily Treating Box and saying that of course Māori people are still going to be treated in the mainstream health system. Hmm. Where do you see the Māori Health Authority's role in trying to prevent things like that? So this is where the importance of partnership between the organisations, all three of our organisations, is imperative to make sure that cases that are so simply preventable, and of course our aroha goes out to the whānau and to that gentleman, um, because that's not the ideal, that's not the ideal, it's not the value proposition that we want to be able to offer our people of Aotearoa. But dealing with bias in a system is important. And remembering that during a time of COVID where we've had that much pressure on the front line and people make assessments um, and, and of course we make judgments and we want to be able to support to make sure that all of our kaimahi throughout the system are able to make judgments that don't include any bias, whether it be against people who have, may have a drug history or people who are, you know, people who are Māori or people with disabilities and so on and so forth. So I think moving forward our focus has to be on the future. How do we create a better system? How do we make sure that people don't fall through the gaps? How do we ensure that, for instance, um, otitis media is treated in primary care, that people have better access to make sure that things that are preventable are dealt with sooner? There's also been some Māori nurses calling for um, a Māori nurse workforce to be prioritised. 
Oh, which is absolutely on our program. So um, we're about to release our chief advisors, which will include uh, a, a consortium of chief advisor medical, uh, nursing, midwifery, allied health, and most importantly, kaimanaki. And I say that because during the COVID response, you would have seen in, a, in here in this building, you will see the kaimanaki workforce who have stood up, they've become vaccinators, they've done that PCR testing when we didn't have the numbers in our clinical spaces to do so. So we want to make sure that there's a space at the table to have a conversation and work out what more could that workforce do in terms of mobilising responses. So by yes, absolutely total. And of course, I'm a registered nurse, so I want to make sure there are more like me out there. Okay, Kia ora.